All right. So uh, can you hear the slide I'm sharing now? Can you see the slide on professional development that I'm sharing now? Yes. All right, that's great. Um, good morning. Welcome you all to webinar three in a series of professional development of PD webinars exclusive to teachers of English at kindergarten to grade 12 throughout Vietnam using the new textbook series proudly brought to you by the PD webinar organizing committee with the support, consultation and guidance from the Board of Directors and the Board of Secretaries, VTSO Association of VTI and Regional English Language Office of RELO, the US Embassy Hanoi Vietnam, as well as the sponsorship from VTI, RELO, Longman Pearson Vietnam, ISET, Clever Learn Hanoi and Talking English. We'd like to extend our thanks to all the participants for being interested in registering and arranging your time to attend webinar three. My name is Chang, a lecturer at Hanoi National University of Education, HNUE, and currently a PhD student at Faculty of Education, Monash University, Australia. I'm the initiator of the PD webinar series and one member of the organizing committee. Other members are Ms. Tati Mai Hương, Thái Nguyên University, Ms. Do Thị Phu Mai, my colleague at HNUE, Mr. Chen Quang Nam, Ho Chi Minh University of Education, and Ms. Chit Ngoc Anh, Banking Academy of Vietnam, and currently a PhD student at University of Canterbury, New Zealand. Thanks all the members of the organizing committee for spending your precious time organizing the webinar so far and joining webinar three today with me as the moderator. Ms. Mai as the secretary, Ms. Huang as one of the facilitators and Ms. Ngoc Anh as a member of the webinar organizing committee. Let me kick off by introducing a little bit about the webinar series. As you can see on the slides, there are four main themes of the series of PD webinars, namely uh, English language teaching or ELT methodologies, using information and communication technologies or ICT in ELT, testing and assessment and professional development or PD. Webinar one about teaching integrating skills bring a great success with the participation of Dr. Ha Van Singh as the speaker, Dr. Chen Dang Khánh Linh as the main facilitator, Ms. Lê Thu Hằng, Ms. Nguyễn Thị Thu Thảo, Mr. Đỗ Mạnh Cương and Ms. Phạm Thị Hải Ngọc as the facilitators. Webinar 2 entitled Online Blended Learning Design and Delivery with Ms. Nguyễn Thị Lan Hương as the speaker, Ms. Zhang Thị Chang as the main facilitator, Mr. Phạm Đức Thuận and Ms. Nguyễn Đức Ân and 2K12 teachers, Ms. Bù Thị Liên and Ms. Nguyễn Thị Thúy as the facilitators, and Ms. Hoàng Thị Quỳnh as the guest teachers. And that brings me nicely on with the introduction about webinar 3. The topic of webinar three is test design and development. And our speaker is Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, founding director, Center for Testing and Assessment, ULIS VNU Hanoi, and the second vice president of the Asian Association for Language Assessment. Thank you so much, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, for spending your precious time preparing the sharing, the pre and post webinar reference materials. Um, Dr. Lê Chầm Hương is our main facilitator who has been supporting Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh during the past two months to prepare for the webinar. It's our great honor to have the participation of two university lecturers, Ms. Nguyễn Thị Phương Thảo and Ms. Phạm Thị Thanh Huyền, and one K-12 teacher, Ms. Đào Thị Ngân, as the facilitator. Another K-12 teacher, as you can see on the slide, Ms. Nguyễn Thị Sao cannot attend the webinar today. Therefore, Ms. Tha Thị Mai Hương, the coordinator of the webinar series, is also one facilitator today. Together with the sharing from Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, there are also the sharings from Ms. Nguyễn Thị Phương Thảo and Ms. Tha Thị Thanh Huyền. Thanks all the facilitators so much for sharing the experience 
sending the questions to the speaker and participating our webinars today. To all the participants, please feel free to interact with our facilitators during the webinars and after the webinars for the follow-up activities. After this introduction, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, together with Ms. Nguyễn Thị Phương Thảo and Ms. Phạm Thị Thanh Huyền, shares her experience related to test design and development, followed by a discussion between the facilitators and the speaker. If the participants have any other questions or ideas, please take note and save them to the Q&A and suggestions for follow-up activities. Finally, I give a brief summary of this webinar and provide several information on the next webinar. At the end of the section, we will provide a short quiz for participants to verify attendance at the webinar and to be considered for an electronic certificate. After each live webinar, the sharing materials and recording will be available on the Vietiso Association website. Now it's high time to move on to the sharing from Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, together with Ms. Nguyễn Thị Phương Thảo and Ms. Phạm Thị Thanh Huyền. I hope that you have read the pre-webinar references suggested by Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh and have tried some professional act development activities recommended by the organizing committee so that you can get the most from the webinar's experience. Um, now, Please, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, I'll stop sharing my slide and please take the stage. Hello, everyone. Just let me to share my slides first. Okay, can you see my slides now? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, again, hello, everyone. It's my great honor to be the speaker of this webinar number three. Actually, it's not easy for the speaker to interact with you when we don't see each other. So I invite everyone to get ready with your keyboard and interact with me via the chat box uh, during the webinar, especially during some quizzes and um, the discussion and sharing time so that we can see your views and your contribution to the webinar. And maybe first, place, just saying hi or heavy, uh, hello to myself and to all the group here. And um, well, I now like to start with a movie clip from the film Karate Kid, which is a, a film about a bullied boy learning Kung Fu to gain uh, self-esteem and protect, uh, protect himself. Get ready with this. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, I got a good foundation here. You know, like I said, I'm just... I'm not being hard to teach me as other people, you know? Hang it up. Now? Take it down. Just take it down. Put it on. Take it off. How did you get Take all this? Off. Can you just tell me why I'm Take doing this? Off. And Take it down. Take it down. Take it down. Hang on. Take it down. On. Take it off. So for the whole lesson, it is uh, just a the ground. sequence of different actions Pick it up. his jacket. Hang it up. Take it down. Put it on. Take it off. I put my jacket on a thousand times. I took it off a thousand times. And he okay? really got this disappointed stupid. and bored. I'm done. And was about to quit. Beat me up if they want to. I'm here. Yeah. 
Check it on. It's on. I already checked. Check it on. When is first Kung Fu test? Strong. Check it on. Herb. Check it off. you enjoy this movie clip and uh, I'd like you now to share your viewpoints uh, in the chat box and answer these two questions. The first question is in the last part of the clip you see a series of tests of people competences. Can you tell what they tested? And the question number two would be what does the clip imply about test of language competence? And uh, could you share your views in the chat box, maybe for two minutes, please? Start. Your time to start now. I see some uh, answers here, like the Okong Lee um, says that I think the tests are about mm -hmm. interpretation, coordination, movement, detection, and concentration. Okay, so for question number two, what does this test of language Question number two.
for your sharings. I'd like to move on now. And I think, uh, well, in this case, we can really think of language competence, similarly in the way that we look at um, the, the Kung Fu competence. Let's now look on the screen. Uh, this is a very popular model of language ability proposed by Bushman and Palmer in 1996. And in this, the language is actually composed of many components, many different areas of knowledge, different skills or sub-skills, different competences and sub-competences. And I think one of the implications that um, I could have, uh, the reflection I could have about the movie clip is actually this, the componential aspect of the uh, competency framework. And in fact, language ability, ability should be also considered the uh, composition of these uh, multiple sub skills and sub competencies in that way. And um, so, Boschman and Palmer's model of language ability is actually uh, the basis for the popular common European framework of reference of languages. And this is this framework. Um, widely known as the CEFR, is also the basis of the Vietnam's sixth level language competency. In Vietnamese, we say, Vietnam. And this is also the common basis for the elaboration of language, language syllabuses, um, curriculum guidelines, examination or assessments, textbooks, and etc. Then, this CEFR also provides definitions of different levels of proficiency, which allows learners' progress to be measured or assessed at each stage of learning and on a lifelong basis. And the CEFR also provides a comprehensive description of what language learners at a certain levels of proficiency can do and expected, uh, expected to be able to do. And the, also, uh, we can identify what knowledge and skills learners have to develop for every level of proficiency. And for you as a teacher, you can also identify at the certain level of, um, of the learning process, like grade two or grade five, what knowledge and skills your learners are expected to have at that stage. And that means the CEFR can provide the means to reflect on the current practice and to ensure what learners' um, real needs are met, whether they, they have met the uh, expect, expected needs or expected um, outcomes or not. And in fact, in the CEFR, um, language proficiency is also um, reflected or divided into different components, language activities, language strategies, and language competencies. Out of the 54 illustrative scales in this CEFR, they are subdivided into these three main um, components, which are further developed into um, the three categories of production, receptions, or interactions identified or described in the six levels from A1 to C2 levels. And of course, also for each, as uh, on, the screen, on the screen you can see, for language competencies, for example, is subdivided into the linguistic competencies, pragmatic competencies, and sociolinguistic competencies. And in the same way, um, for example, if we take the examples of vocabulary uh, control, in the CEFR, you will see the descriptors of the illustrative scales by levels from A1 to C2, like this. And I'd like to take the examples of the A2 level, and teachers and test developers can identify so what the students can do for A2 level for in terms of vocabulary control, for example. Here they say, um, at A2 level, learners can control a narrow repertoire 
dealing with concrete everyday needs. Now let's take this um, example and I'd like you to join in a small um, uh, sharing activities and could you now type in the chat box some examples of the vocabulary of the so-called concrete everyday needs that the students at a A2 level need to acquire. And now, could you please type in the examples of the concrete everyday needs then? We have two minutes for this. Your time starts now. And Mai and Chang, could you help to post the link on, yeah, I can see on the chat box here. So could everyone just uh, assess into that and type your answers in that box that opens to you? Yeah, there is the link provided in the chat box. Please click the link and type in your answer, please. Uh, Miss Queen, I think that the teachers are chatting in the Zoom chat. Of, <laughs> I must say, family, school, daily routines. Yeah, could you also provide the examples of exactly what words or phrases or grammatical expressions that refers to family, school, daily routines and hobbies that the student at A2 level can and acquire and perform. Oh, I can see on the screen here, for example, like topics, personal habits, um, examples, related, famil familiar information. Yeah, uh, uh, could you share the concrete, the, the words and the phrases? Okay, Ho Thị Nhân say, get up, brush, do household chores and wash. And family, great. Oh, yeah, and we say brush your teeth, bunch of flowers, okay. Dad, yeah. Great. Thank you very much for your sharing. And actually we can continue with this uh, poll um, and even after this webinar. And then with that, if you come back to this uh, window later, you can already have the collections of the concrete, the words and uh, phrases and the vocabulary that it, the A2 learner need to acquire in terms of the concrete everyday needs. So this is how you actually can identify um, the specific, what we call sub um, areas of knowledge or skills or competencies in terms of vocabulary for the A2 level. And I'd like to end this um, screen at this point. And also in order to identify the, um, the specific that you want to test in your test, you can also look at the um, um, illustrative uh, scales or descriptors in the CEFR. And on the screen now, you see these are the CEFR resources where these teachers and test developers can um, look for different sub competencies. And the first one is the um, CEFR um, uh, illustrative descriptors, the lab by level by European Council. And you can also look at the equals descriptor banks or also the LT, the like the Association of Language Testers in Europe for um, the uh, resources on subcompetencies. Now let's find the answer to the questions. What is a test? And I'd like to um, start by the uh, start with the definition by Brown in 2004 and he defined test as a subset of assessment and tests are certainly not the only form of assessment that the teacher can make. Tests can be useful devices 
but they are only one among many procedures and tasks that teachers can ultimately use to assess students. What does this definition of test imply? In my view, it means that all the tests that we use at any stage in your course should be in line with other assessment and teaching procedures and tasks in the course. And it reflects the so-called the systematicity of test. So all these activities should serve the common end goal of reaching the expected learning outcomes of the course. So they should be in one system in that case. Here is another definition of test by Brown in 1994. And in this view, test is a method of measuring a learner's competence, either ability or knowledge in a given area. What does this definition tell us? Well, it says, it tells us that a test measures a certain area of competences or certain abilities, or it will test a certain test construct. And for the third view by Nathan Carr introduced to us in 2011, he sees test as tools. And he says that when you borrow or buy a tool, you need to know a specific types that fits the job, not just a general tool. And no tool is perfect for every job. Some are useful for only one purpose. Some are good for a few purposes. But the more things a tool is used for, the fewer things it will properly do well. And I really like this definition, this viewpoint of test. And what does it tell us? First, it says, it tells us that a test should accurately measure what is expected to test. Or in other words, it should accurately measure the test construct, the expected uh, test construct. And second, in terms of test use, um, cars stresses that um, a test should serve a specific and concrete purpose only not just like um, a vague ideas of testing and assessment. So we need to identify a very specific and concrete purpose for each test. And the third um, implication that I can get from this view is that there are certain task type. There are a lot of task types, but only certain task types can serve your purpose better than others. And in fact, I'm going to talk about oh, on this aspect during my webinar about test uh, that I, I uh, reflect on the three definition, three views of test just now. And in terms of the construct of a language test, and in, by definition, a construct is what is tested by a test items or a task either an area of knowledge, a skill or sub-skills, a sub competency. And um, a test that consists of multiple test items can assess a total construct. So the total of the constructs that individual items are designed to assess. Let's work on a quiz on test construct now. And again, I'd like to um, invite you to get ready with your keyboards and type your answers. Are you ready with the first one? Now, I'd like you to match each item with linguistic knowledge construct that uh, is assessed in the task here, in the test item. What does the first item Okay, I see here uh, from Yun saying 
is uh, phonetics. Correct. Yeah. Now, is uh, phonetics. Correct. Yeah. Now, how about this? What does this item? Mang giúp mẹ ra cái. Này, Nam ơi, mẹ sai con mà không được à? Đi đi. Mẹ đang webinar mà. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, no, okay. Yes. So, um, what does this item, what textual knowledge is tested in this case? Anybody can share your answers? Coherence by Do Công Lý. Conjunctions by Ming Tu. Okay. I think that is the knowledge of cohesion. Okay, now the next one. How about this? What textual knowledge is tested? In order to identify the answers of these questions, if you can recall the framework of language abilities and also the CEFR, and you can identify the sub-competencies of language proficiency and language competence in order to, to find the answers for this. So I see Emma say reading comprehension. Like in this case, I think that is the rhetorical um, knowledge. Yeah. Now the next one. Now we move to pragmatics knowledge. So what is the construct in this case? Any ideas? Okay, what is the functional knowledge? And this example is actually a TOEIC uh, item that I um, got from uh, um, this webinar. Next one. In terms of pragmatic knowledge, what is tested here? is the social linguistic knowledge okay and now i'd like to invite my colleague um, Ms. to share her analysis of the construct of some test in practice and i'd like to stop my slide share now and i give the floor to Ms. for her sharing how could you share your slide now Um, no. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah. So um, it's my pleasure uh, to share with you some of the um, real examples about the tech construct, which I took from your uh, test um, and the test pack. So um, as I got um, the examples from the high school, the school teachers, I took uh, one test for English 4, so it's for grade 4. And this one is the list, um, um, is the full test, cover a number um, of skill. The first one is listening. So as you can see in task one, the students are required to listen and circle um, the pictures, whether it's A or B. And as you can uh, see here, the construct that the teacher aim to test will be listening skill, yeah, as a, the main construct. And in that, we have the construct component that can be considered as listening for details. Okay. Um, and the next one, the next part is reading and writing. And in this part, the students are required to look at the pictures and then they need to write the word 
based on uh, the firstly they need to recognize the kind of vocabulary they need to fill in the blank and then they will see the hint as the uh, as ordering the letter here and this one refer to the construct um, can be named as linguistic competencies or now uh, followed by the CFR and the grammatic or the grammatical knowledge followed um, Bachman and Palmer in 1996. And this one referred to the vocabulary. In the next part, the students are required to order the words to make it a full um, sentence. Yeah, and here the, st the students are, give, um, are provided with an example and they are required to order the words to make the sentence, to make the five sentences. Yeah, so based on this, I can recognize that the teacher will try to test the two constructs. Okay, the first one is the linguistic competencies um, and specifically it go with grammar with some specific um, structures like would like, okay, or favorite, or like. Okay. So we can see that this one um, are taken from the, uh, the syllabus of uh, English 4. And this one has um, other thing that the students have learned in their units, previous units, and it's the time for them to be tested. Also, at the same time, the teacher also aim to test the textual knowledge or pragmatic competencies in a way that the student has to order the word to make the, a meaningful sentence. So it is a way that we try to test the coherence within a sentence, okay? They need to make it meaningful, okay? So you can see in one, um, in one task, the teacher can test more than one construct, okay? Um, and the last one, um, also belong to reading and writing. The student um, are asked to read and number the sentences in uh, the correct order, okay? And the conversation begins with zero in um, sentence C, okay? So in this activity, the student will need to order the sentences to make it a full conversation, okay? So this one refers to the pragmatic competencies in which the student will show their competence uh, to, to, to deal with turn taking, okay? They need to see how Bob and Linda show the turn taking and the conversation. And the second one also, they, can, um, they need to make the link between the sentences in a conversation, which go very closely with coherence, okay? So this one is very specific example of one test for the grade four student in um, the English test. Yeah, and as you can see, this one um, shows us, the first one, the teacher try to open in the activity, in the test. And the second one, as Ms. Quinn mentioned, we have um, the focus uh, of the test as it needs to show the systematicity, okay, and the substantive grounding. So that means that the teacher need to base on the schedule or the curriculum of grade four to design the test. And this one I have checked with um, the course book of grade four and I can see that the teacher have mentioned like all the key points they try to, uh, they want to test in the, ex, um, in all the tasks here. Okay, so now I would like to leave the floor to, uh, for Ms. Quinn to continue with um, the webinar. Thank you very much, Kao. And now um, we all know that it's very important to identify what you want to test or the test construct. But now um, I think in order to choose what to test or choose the test construct for your items, the teachers need to consider the following aspect. The first you need to identify the purpose of the test use, what and how the test results are used. And the second one is that you should be aware of very clearly of the expected learning outcomes of the course, or in other words, what competencies the students need to acquire by the end of the course. As I will explain further later, for example, if 
you want to design to choose the test constructs for your midterm test, for example, you may want to choose the partial competences of the standards or expected learning outcomes of the, of the, of the whole course. However, if that is a final test, of, um, uh, and then of course you should you want to you may want to cover all the competencies that the students your student expected to acquire um, after completing the the course. So it's very important for you to identify the test contracts in the uh, alignments with the final goals of the course. I'd like now to um, talk more about the use of language test. And uh, so here is the diagram that, um, that shows the steps involved in this use. And basically first, the, based on the students or the test takers performance of the test task, the assessment or record will be made for example, by uh, uh, after the scoring or marking, um, each student will be given a score or a description of their performance. And based on this bracket, interpretations about the test taker's ability will be made and whether they have met the expected outcomes or they haven't they fail or not fail would be the decision that is made after that. So based on the interpretation of the ability, decisions will be made. And based on the, of course, these decisions will have consequence or consequences on the teacher teaching or the students learning or even on other um, relevant stakeholders, for example, it may have a consequence on the school if the school have to um, establish or um, uh, arrange another uh, relearning of, of, of the course, for example. And even the consequence can be on parents. So basically, this is the model of the language um, assessments or language test use. And based on the purpose of um, the testing or assessment, there are three main um, types of assessments that I'd like to discuss here uh, following the questions of um, the assessment record, who makes that, um, the who makes and does the interpretations, um, what does the interpretation tell and also what types of decision made out of the assessment of the testing and the consequences that is um, uh, related to the use of this test. So these are the three main types of assessment. In the first type, which is called assessment of learning, teacher will be the one who make the scoring or description of the student's performance. And teachers also make the interpretation of whether student meets the expected standards or outcomes after learning and teachers also make decisions about whether students have met the expected outcomes and can graduate or stop learning or have to re-learn uh, uh, learn the course again and the consequences are mainly on students chance to be entitled as an achiever or graduate of the course However, for assessment for learning, um, teacher makes the scoring and description of the performance, but both the teacher and the student may also participate in the interpretations of the um, uh, performance. And the, normally teacher will make decisions about what the student or what should be done to improve the upcoming learning to meet expected learning outcomes. So the decision is about what comes next, not about what has been done already. And the consequences are, uh, for, uh, of the assessment for learnings are both on teachers' teaching plan and or methods and the students' learning plans. Although the emphasis is still on the former, the teacher normally will 
adapt their uh, teaching plans in order to help to assist the students to meet the expected learning outcomes. The third types of assessment is assessment as learning. In, in these types of assessment, either teacher or the students or the peer students make the assessment records of performance. So when the student does um, their, their, their own assessment, that is called self-assessment, but also peer assessment is also very frequent uh, form of assessment as learning. And in uh, assessment as learning, student uh, will make the interpretations of um, uh, the performance, but of course, possibly with the teacher's guidance or assistance. And in these types of assessment, students make decisions about what should be done to improve the upcoming learning, to meet the expected learning outcomes. So again, the decision is about what comes next, but who will make the decision is actually the students. And in terms of consequences, the consequences of assessment as learning are mostly on students' learning plans and sometimes also on the teacher's teaching. So um, for the first types of assessment, assessments of learning, that is the summative assessment when actually this can help to sum up, right? Or in other words, it's actually reflect back to what has been learned. However, assessment for learning and assessment as learning are called formative assessment because the, um, the use of the, test res of the test results are mostly for, the, uh, for what comes afterwards. And so for formative tests that we use, um, normally given in the process of learning, either a midterm test or maybe even a test um, uh, during uh, the uh, different units in the course. And these tests will provide information about how well the learning is progressing towards the final goal or expected outcome. However, for the summative test, these tests are normally uh, are given at the end of a course or unit or program and they provide information about how much students have learned and if they have achieved expected outcomes. So there are very classic examples of um, the chef testing um, a dish, which is a formative test of the, of the cooking. Um, and however, when uh, the customer tests that, uh, dish is actually already a summative test of the cooking. Now, I'd like now to share, uh, to, to invite the sharing by Ms. Phan Thi Thang Huyen. And she's going to share with us the uh, practices of summative and formative assessment in her real context. And um, again, I will stop my share and I invite uh, Huyen to uh, get in. Mm, thank you, Chikwin, for that. Uh, hello, everyone. I would like to share my part of uh, the teaching and learning English at our university, Taiping uh, University of Medicine and Pharmacy. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, for the uh, students at our university, uh, they study, uh, the first year student, they study the textbook, um, uh, solution pre intermediate. And before uh, entering into courses, they will do the placement test of the A2 level to place classes according to their proficiency. And uh, uh, during the time study there, they, uh, we create the both formative and summative courses, um, sorry, test. Uh, the the formative are uh, given during the semester with the uh, use of app model because we create the quizzes of grammar exercises and uh, reading comprehension activities in advance. And we also uh, check the oral presentations or uh, a performance of students by uh, giving them the chance to role play or uh, having interviews uh, with uh, different activities like uh, describing, explaining, retelling or paraphrasing or summarizing uh, the topic or the knowledge they already learned. 
And uh, uh, um, uh, for the summative test, uh, we have the it in the middle and at the end of semester. And for, for the midterm test, we check the uh, listening, we, we test the listening and speaking ability. And for the final one, we have one uh, final test, or it is a written test with uh, um, grammar, vocabulary, reading, and writing. And uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, these are the objectives for uh, five units, because uh, the students in, in our university, they uh, have uh, 45 hours each semester. So we can't cover the whole 10 units of the sol solution pre-intermediate. So we just cover five units for each semester. And these are the objectives of, uh, regarding grammar, vocab, reading and writing. Of, uh, uh, the first five units, mm. as you can see here, I want to focus on unit three with the grammar of quantity expressions or uh, vocabulary of landscapes between the city and the country. And um, at the end of each unit, uh, as you can see here on the screen, it is a progress test of, uh, after unit three. Uh, we create a test aiming at checking the uh, students' quantity expressions and the vocabulary of the landscapes between the city and the country. Uh, and uh, uh, after this uh, progress test, um, we do hope that uh, we can check the students' ability of Mm, using the quantity expressions and the uh, vocab landscapes. Uh, because uh, after this one, based on the, the mark that the student get, we will decide uh, whether we will uh, give the students more um, uh, exercises on quantitative or landscapes um, vocab. Uh, or um, I think this uh, relate to the um, three different uh, kinds of assessment uh, that uh, uh, Ms. Queen has already mentioned to you, because uh, here, uh, when we have the result of the students, we will know that uh, whether they will need more exercises to improve their use of uh, quantity expression or not. And I think that one, it is a, a, a assessment of learning. And uh, if we give the student uh, more exercises to, uh, to do at home uh, or to do outside the class, uh, it wouldn't be the uh, assessment for learning. And um, uh, based on the results of that progress test, the student themselves can uh, know more about their current uh, uh, competency. So they know that whether they would uh, have to find and, uh, more exercises on quantity expressions or not. Uh, and this one, uh, I think it relates, it, it is, like a, a assessment as a learning for students. Uh, and here is a, um, a diagram that we use in our university. Uh, as you can see here, what I have Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, there is something wrong with the voice from your computer. Please check because we cannot hear you very clearly. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, yes. okay, now. So, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, yep. it's much better now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Maybe I, I was a little bit too far from the microphone. Uh, is it much better? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, be before I talk about the progress test, that uh, after unit three, we did the test for quantity expressions and landscapes, uh, vocabulary of students. And uh, um, after that, um, uh, we, we know the result of the test. And uh, uh, with, with the result of the test, we can, um, I think this one relates to the uh, assessment of learning that Ms. Quinn has already mentioned to you. And based on the result of that test, uh, we would know about the, the current um, competency of students. So we may have to decide whether we create more exercises of quantity expression for them if the, the mark were too low. So um, uh, that one, uh, I think it relates to assessment uh, uh, for learning. And uh, uh, for the students, 
if they know that their ability and that their use of quantitative expression uh, was um, not as good, uh, was not good enough, they wouldn't try to find out the more exercises to do. And uh, I think this one is uh, assessment as learning. And uh, uh, this one, uh, it is a um, diagram that we use in our university. Uh, as I have, have already mentioned to you, uh, that uh, we, um, at the beginning of the semester, we have to set clear learning ob objectives. And uh, th then uh, based on the clear learning objective, we have to uh, prepare the lesson plans in advance. And based on that, we have the teaching and uh, modeling. Uh, with the teaching and modeling, we also have the uh, ongoing formative assessment for students. And uh, based on this, we can know about the current situation uh, of the students' uh, knowledge and uh, ability and, and their competency. Uh, and from uh, that one, uh, the student, uh, uh, for us, we may have the second chance to teach the student that one again. Uh, the student also can have an independent practice with the ongoing formative uh, assessment uh, that we provide them uh, on uh, and model or um, uh, uh, based on the activity in class. And uh, at the end of each unit or at the end of the semester, we have the summative assessment. Uh, and then uh, if the result was good, we can keep going with the next unit. Uh, and as you can see here, it is a, a slide of um, one piece of the final semester test that um, because the students study the first five units of the solution pre-intermediate. So um, uh, here uh, in the progress test, they have the individual sentences to check their ability of quantity expression. But then uh, now in the final semester test, uh, we do uh, match them in uh, a dialogue, but they are, the, the students also have to show their ability in using quantity expressions uh, based on uh, uh, several uh, questions in this text. Um, and uh, uh, that's the end of my uh, sharing for uh, this one. Mm, thank you so much for listening. And uh, now, uh, Ms. Quinn, could you uh, keep going with your part? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nguyen. Okay, and I'd like to um, note again some important points that we can learn from Huyen's sharing and also the sharing by Tao a few minutes ago. And the first one is that um, all the tests that we use in our course should be substantively grounded, which means that they are based on a recognized and verifiable area of content. And uh, the two sources um, that teachers should consider to assure the substantive grounding of the test of all curriculum related tests are uh, the first one, the curriculum. Uh, in other words, we, the teachers should be um, fully aware of and also consider um, the expected learning outcomes and as well as the, uh, the teaching plan of the course in order to identify if your test um, fall in at a certain um, point of time during the course. So what should be tested then and what the test can be used for. And the second one is, of course, the CEFR as the competencies framework. And of course, the Vietnam's sixth level uh, language competency framework. Um, because this framework um, as a competency framework um, can help us to identify the component of different um, uh, component and subcomponents of language um, competence. So in this case, it, when you design your test, the question would be whether you want to focus on certain components or cover different components of language competences. And when you consider this, I'd like you to have a look at these two picture of the zigsaw games. And in this picture on the left, you would see the different pieces of saw games are focused on one area or one component only. And by doing so, 
you can actually have a better image of that area, right? Better image of um, the certain area that all the pieces are focused on. However, on the right, the picture on the right, the pieces are dispersed to cover multiple areas or components. So with, by doing this, um, we cannot see clearly or we do not have the very good view of the certain area uh, like we can do in the, in the former, in the, in, in the left picture. However, you can have a better coverage of the overall competences. So when, if you recall Huyen's case just now in for unit three test that she talked about, so she kind of focused more on the quantitative expressions like we do for the first jigsaw picture. However, in the final test, the test will cover more areas or components of competences. We cannot zoom in, in quantitative uh, expressions, but we can have the better ideas of all the expected uh, components of uh, language uh, that the student is supposed to apply it during the course. So I think this is very important for us to consider uh, whether we focus on just certain um, components or to cover many, providing we have the same number of test items in a test. Language test. The first is the normal test. Um, that are used in order to categorize the students into levels or compare the performances of the students, of a certain student, by other to perform the normative group in order to make the comparisons. However, criterion reference tests are used to provide explicit information as to what the students can and can't do in relation to one or more standards or criteria. But here, the students will perform with what is expected level um, of the course. And for the normal reference uh, test, you can see the test constructs will uh, normally cover a range of different levels of proficiency. Um, you know, according to the CEFR uh, framework. So the test construct cover more than uh, one levels of proficiencies or even um, different sub levels of proficiencies. However, for criterion reference, the um, test, uh, the, the constructs are closely allied to the standards or the expected proficiencies. They may or may not cover multiple levels of proficiency. So when you decide what to test and why you want to test, you can decide whether you design a norm reference or the criterion reference test. And another way to classify tests is based mostly on the way the test will be scored. For the first type, objective tests are normally called, scored objectively based on the number of right and wrong answers, because these tests will have the definite right or wrong answers. And examples of these tests are multiple choice question tests, true, false, or matching. However, for subjective tests, they are evaluated by giving an opinion on the level of the performance against a set of criteria or the rubrics um, uh, based on the standards that we, we expect the student to perform. And examples of these subjective tests are interview speaking test or essay writing test. And then another way to identify, uh, to classify tests is um, either discrete point test in which we will, um, we will design uh, individual test items to test each specific and independent uh, construct. Here on the left, you could see each items will focus on one certain area. 
And normally you can see um, these tests are mostly used to test the specific items or uh, specific constructs or competences of the linguistic competence. However, for um, the so-called integrated test, more than one competencies are required for the student to do this task. And in this case, for example, you will see the student will need to show their abilities in terms of uh, knowledge of the uh, part of speech, of the grammar, um, even the reading comprehensions and the, uh, of the uh, cohesions, for example. So different areas of language competences are in use in order to perform this task. Now, the next types to, identi to classify tests is either the tests are direct um, in, in the sense that they, um, they are tests that uh, require test checkers um, to use the ability or the construct that is supposed to be being assessed. However, in indirect tests, um, uh, they this, there are those that attempt to assess one of the so-called productive skills through related tasks that do not require any productions. In this case, that is a multiple choice questions on your right here. And it indirectly asks the stu student to show the knowledge of what can greeting be like, right? What a conversation of reading we like, the functional um, uh, um, knowledge of reading. However, the student do not have to perform this orally. So this is an indirect test. However, I'd like to uh, share with you the viewpoints by many experts. They believe that speaking tests are called semi-direct tests. Uh, in fact, they are the semi-direct testing. Now, in your chat box, could you share your views why many experts believe this? Could you spend one minute on this and share your viewpoint on why the experts actually uh, believe speaking tests that we use now are called semi-direct testing only? not direct. Any ideas? Could you type in your chat box? Okay, so we can say because it's not a real life situation. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas from the participants? Yeah, in fact, I agree with Huyen. This is actually refers to the so-called continuums of assessment for the direct and indirect. So in that, by definitions, so direct means that um, the test contract, right? The, so in other words, what we want, um, what competence, that we want the student to perform is actually produced in or uh, performed uh, by performing the task, uh, the test task. But in the case, for example, if you ask the student to do a role play and the student then in that case can do like a role play between the interviewer as the employer and the student will perform the, uh, the uh, role play uh, or simulated kind of uh, job interview. In that case, the performance, the ability that is shown in that task performance is not exactly the job interviewing, isn't it? So in that case, it is just a semi-direct kind of testing of the ability to perform uh, in a job interview. So in that sense, that is an indirect. And also, if we look at this direct and indirect as a continuum, and we can see at some point, 
for um, the the job, the wrong play will appear somewhere here, nearer to the left end or left uh, uh, in the left directions of the continuums. But if we ask the student to perform, for example, in a speaking test, in a speaking test, if you ask the student to talk about their hobbies and um, uh, interests and habits, that would be further down to the left side, right? More direct than a role play job interview in that sense. So, so if you look at that, that is a continuum. And these fields of continual or uh, assessment can also be used for all other uh, ways of classification of test. You can either have formative and summative. In the case that Huyen shared with us uh, about the test at the end of unit three, it can be a summative test to test the ability of the students expected to apply at the end of the unit. But it can also be a formative test if that is used um, as uh, checking whether the student um, um, needs further learning or further teaching by the, by the teacher. So the test that we can share will be somewhere here. But then, of course, you may have other tests on the other side if of the formative, it is basically used to identify what should be done next, or the final test would be more on the right side to the summative. And with that case, similar to all other classification of tests as well. Now, I'd like now to move to the uh, different part, um, a different topic, which is about the test task. Um, and these are believed to be the building blocks of the test. And what makes a task? Besides the construct or the portion of a construct, um, in other words, what is tested or what is assessed in the task. We also need to have to, to consider the input that test takers must process, or in other words, the prompt. So what you provide um, the students or the test takers with in that task. And the third aspect is what you expect them to respond, or the form of the expected response of the task. And here on the screen, you will see the commonly used task format, the selected response, with the subtitle or subtypes uh, on the right and the limited production um, uh, the deletion based extended productions and portfolios and now i'd like to uh, provide some examples of these subtypes of this task like the the multiple choice um, here uh, in this case there's only one correct answers but for the multiple option, multiple choice um, uh, task, there are more than one correct answer for this. And um, for the true false, they are true false not given. There's only one correct answer for the student um, to, to choose. And um, another um, other subtypes of the selected response task includes matching and ordering. However, for limited production task, in this case, that is short answers, the student will provide um, uh, more, uh, um, of course, the longer response, but also there may be some variations that the, the teachers can accept um, for the student to fill in each lines here. And get filled and sentence rewrite uh, is also uh, subtypes of limited production tasks. And in this case, uh, the two examples in which um, the students actually use the input that is provided in the task, uh, prompt based, in order to perform the task. And in the first um, examples here, that is an incomplete outlined um, uh, task. And uh, the below examples in the incomplete 
complete graphic organizer. Again, the production is limited, right? But it, also in these examples, they are chrome based. In the next types of um, tasks, which are the deletion based tasks, the um, students are, are asked to fill in the blanks, like in the closed text or the C test. And in this, for these types of tasks, the teachers need to consider whether they would use the fixed deletion or like every five words or every seconds, uh, seven words, or the um, you know, randoms or the every uh, regular kind of deletions. Or they can have the rational deletions in order to focus on, at this point, for example, quantitative expressions, at the second point, and on uh, cohesion, for example. On the other, um, at least some other one, that would be the way to perform um, the uh, idiomatic expressions, for example. So these are the lesion based tasks. For the extended production task, mostly uh, are, um, for the students uh, to perform the long, uh, a wide range of uh, competencies. And in this case, um, the examples on the screen is called the prompt based when the students are asked to perform uh, to provide several sentences uh, based on the questions right and these types of tasks must be scored using rubrics or rating scales and portfolio is also now a po popular uh, subtypes of uh, the extended production tasks, actually, the special types of pro extended production tasks, in which um, the, test, the students are asked to provide a collection of written or spoken words, normally over a, uh, a period of times, like a few lessons, a few weeks, or even a few months. And these activity involve um, a lot of pre-writing or multiple drafts. Now, I'd like you to share your ideas of the advantages and disadvantages of using multiple choice items and um, portfolios to assess your students. In, and you can think of in terms of a test for a class, for your own class of about 25 students or a test for the whole batch of students, like 250 students, and also consider also the uh, competencies and construct you want to test, like reading comprehension, listening comprehension, or grammatical competence, or vocabulary knowledge. Could you share your ideas of the advantages and disadvantages in these cases, in this in these scenario, in the chat box, please, for two minutes. Your time starts now. Okay, my Hyung already put here. So MC Q items, save times, can test different points of grammar. Scoring is convenient, totally objective, yes. How about disadvantages? Hyung? Yeah, Do Kong Lee says multiple choice is a great mass testing tool. Absolutely, uh, if you consider to test a whole batch of 250 students, um, you may want to choose MCQs, right? Rather than portfolios. And uh, Nga Dao say we can use apps to collect the results. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, but my daughter say it's difficult to design test items, uh, MCQ test items. Yeah, I love this discussion to, to move on, to continue like this. And of course, you can always share more on the chat box of the advantages and disadvantages. 
But I'd like to now to talk about um, the disadvantages and the, the advantages of this commonly used task format. And um, so um, I think for the first three types, like selected response, limited production, and deletion based, it is kind of easier and quicker to score because we have a limited um, uh, numbers of correct answers. And, um, and it is also, they are normally harder to write and more suitable to test discrete point or specific knowledge or competences. But of course, um, the extended and production portfolios uh, harder and more time consuming to score, but they are also easier to write and faster to write than the MCQs and, and um, you know, other types of selected response tasks, for example. And these tasks are kind of more suitable to test integrated skills, skills or competencies uh, and can test multiple constructs at the same time. Well, um, in terms of the continuum here, it's not actually in, uh, intended to show the ordering. It's just my attempt to show the, uh, the differences uh, in, in the pros and cons of these different tasks. It's not intended to show the ordering, okay? Now I'd like to move to also another very important concept in testing, which is the cognitive uh, levels of a test task or test items. Or in other words, that is the levels of complexity of the test items. And I'd like to uh, use Bloom's taxonomy of the cognitive um, uh, demands, cognitive levels here, the six levels. And in the first level, recall and recognitions, the test takers are required to remember or simply recognize the terminology or the facts or the ideas that they, are, they have been taught, they have learned, right? So, so what they need to do is just to re recall and recognize them. And in the second level of uh, uh, cognition required for the test takers, um, the test takers need to understand what is being communicated in the test items, either in the reports or tables or the diagram provided. For the application cognitive level, the test takers will need to apply the ideas, the rules of methods, or the theories that they have learned in order to um, perform in those uh, provided specific situations. And at the analysis level, the uh, students need to break down material or information that are provided in the test, take, uh, test items into constituent parts and detect the relationship and the way they are organized. And at the higher order um, uh, thinking or cognitive level, the synthesis level, for example, the test takers need to integrate different pieces of information into a larger construct or unit, or the and also consider uh, the relationship in the or uh, the way and the way they are organized into a larger whole. For evaluation cognitive level, the test takers need to make a judgment about the values of ideas and solutions, methods, uh, etc. by applying two or more criteria at the same time. And I'm going to talk about a few. Um, so the, uh, the rule of thumb in order to identify well, the complexity of your test uh, items is that you will need to ask or to identify exactly what the student need to do with the tested construct, with what you want to test. So what they need to do with that construct in order to perform the task. So here are the different examples of um, 
a different complexity level uh, on the same test construct, the past tense that I prepared. So for here, the first, in the first items, what the student need to do is, it, is just to recall um, what they have been taught or what they have learned from the textbook or from the lessons, the past tense forms of these books. So they just recall and recognize the forms and provide the form. However, at the comprehension level, for this odd one out, the student will need to really see, hear, and understand that A, B, and C are the past tense when D is not. And they can, understand, they can perform these answers, uh, uh, this task, and provide the answers in that case. And for the third um, example here, the student will, at the application uh, level, the, what the student need to do is to apply um, the knowledge in the, of past tense in the context of about last Sundays and providing the series of different actions that were performed um, in the past. So this is the, uh, the uh, application um, level. However, at the analysis level, like in this um, item, what the student needs to do is really to uh, analyze the um, different pieces of information here. For each item, they would need to analyze which verb which show the underlying um, uh, um, kind of uh, background and which will provide the point of time, uh, the times of reference in order to decide which one is in the past tense and which will be in the continuous pro, uh, aspect. And like for in this case, like in this uh, examples of synthesis um, uh, cognitive level, well, what the student needs to do is to synthesize different pieces of information in order to talk about the causes and the effects of the polluted air in Hanoi uh, during the month. And they, can all, they have to provide examples and evidences which will be provided in the past tense, for example, um, in this case, in order to make a uh, 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 concrete head of productions and uh, united productions. But at the highest level of cognition um, evaluations in this case, um, in the writing task, what are the lessons learned from your recent group uh, environmental project? Describe your project outcomes and make recommendation for future work on the issues. To do this task, students need to make judgments on the use of the past tense in their productions. They need to decide why they use that information, why they use past tense then, when and what to use in order to convey an intended argumentative message. So for this task, it is that the evaluation cognitive level. And um, so now I'd like to talk about um, the development um, procedure of a new task. And here on the screen, you will see the diagram that is introduced in, uh, by LT in 2005. And um, so the procedure includes different phases from the planning phase, design then to the design phase when you identify the test specification and after that based on that you can develop your items and um, when you reach the operational phase um, you develop more items and um, you monitor that and you evaluate those items um, in general the process will be uh, is um, cyclical, in other words, at any phase here, you can actually come back to the earlier phase and to make the refinement of your work. And of course, for the whole um, procedure, review and revision can be done at any stage. 
either by self or by peer or especially by expert reviewers. And in the planning phase, especially when you develop a new test, in the planning, the, the planning phase involves consideration of what to test or the, what the test constructs are, why you want to test, the purpose and the intended use of the results, and of course, how to test. At this point, you need to consider the test type and the task type that you want to use for your task. And of course, um, triangling is very important. However, sadly, uh, it is often neglected in the real practice. And I hope actually after this webinar, you're going to trial your test more. Okay. And now the, here is the test development process in the operational phase. Starting with the commission, when you have the test specification, you can assign who do what, when, and how, right? Who will be in charge of some uh, one or more than uh, uh, or more task, and what types of test constructs, and who will do others? And at the second phase, you would need to do vetting and editing to check technical content and language uh, quality of the test items. Then after that, you do the trialing or pre-testing now on the sample, uh, on the student samples to make sure whether they can work in practice. After that, based on um, that, you would do the item review or the analysis and at this point, you can either accept the items or you reject them. Or in other words, you have to redo the, uh, um, re you write different items or not. And after that, you construct your test papers. So these are the procedure you should do in the operational phase. What does it mean? It means all this can be done based on your test specification. And now I'd like to talk more about, so what is a test specification? It is normally called also a spec or test spec. It is a generative and explanatory blueprint for test items or tasks from which many equivalent test items or tasks can be produced. This is um, the definition by Anderson and all, and all, and Davidson and Lynch in 2002. So, test spec are the documents that explain the rationales behind the various choices that you make um, in for the test development, including what to test, what types of test it is what test uh, task you will use. So you provide the rationale why you make those choices. The test spec also tells the detailed nuts and bolts, in other words, the very detailed instructions of how to phrase the test items. And the test spec is a generative set of instructions for creating the test that helps to make explicit the design decisions in the test to and to allow new versions to be uh, writing in the future by someone um, other than the test developer. So in other words, the um, test fact will also can also be used by you or your colleagues in order to provide similar tests in the future. So what should be included in a test spec? Of course, you need to have the uh, general descriptions of what the test be like, uh, how many tasks, what types of test is it? It can be used for summative use um, or uh, formative, at, uh, when in, during the course, and you also provide the attributes um, about the prompt, right? What you will provide the student with either some guiding questions or a 
paragraph to read first or listening uh, text first, for example. Of course, they, it also includes the response attribute, whether that is just a few sentences or whether just three words or the whole essays. And normally, the test pack will also provide sample items. And um, it may include specification supplements, for example, no more than 30% uh, on grammatical, um, uh, uh, like for, on past tense, because like the rest, 20% uh, um, on um, future, for example, right, form of the, or subjunctive of the form of the verb, for example. So you can add more information. Um, in the text spec. Um, one, um, I, uh, one question that I received from a lot of teachers are about the weighting of test items. Of course, normally, especially in, in, um, in criterion reference test, all items are weighted equally. In other words, one correct answer earns one point. However, this is not always the case because it is also possible for us to assign weighting to individual tests, uh, questions or items according to the level of importance you determine. For example, if you want to focus on one uh, specific uh, area of um, knowledge or competence, you may assign more weighting to the um, items uh, on that um, test constructs than others. And uh, however, a weighted score or weighted grade is merely the average of a set of grades where each set carries a different amount of importance. And um, weighting needs to be specified clearly in the test specifications. And this is very important. Now, um, I'd like to invite Tao to be on the screen again to share on the analysis of some sample test specification that we received um, uh, before the webinar from some um, uh, K to 12, uh, uh, K1 to 12 um, teachers. And I will stop my share and invite Tao to jump in. Tao. Yeah. Okay. So, hello everyone again. Yeah. So now I'm back with um, the second sharing on the test specification. Um, actually, I put it as uh, samples here, but I will just focus on one test pack, uh, which we received from the school teachers. And um, the focus for today is on the test pack designed by the teachers in grade seven. This one is a 45 minutes test. And let me show you the original version of the test, uh, of the test bag with um, some of my analysis, okay? Uh, as you can see here, this one is, is called the matrix. So basically it's not a full test bag. It's just the matrix with some of the key information about the test. And I um, highlighted the main parts of uh, the matrix here. So, for the first one, it is a topic Excuse of main me, contents. Tao. Yes? Uh, we are not seeing the matrix. Oh, I'm sorry. I think there is something wrong with the hyperlink. Okay. So um, let me share the... Um... No. Um... Can you see that now? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, you can open the new share. You can you can open the new share. Yeah. You can uh, share and then you click on the top file instead of using the hyperlink. Mm -hmm. New share here, right? Okay, and. Um, I think you open you open the matrix first, and then you you you, you yeah, open yeah. the new shape. Yeah. So I need to I need to escape. Uh, 
Shari, can I just stop share and then I will yeah. open my um, word file first. Yeah, and then you yeah. share. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yeah. So this one is the matrix uh, by um, info English 7. And as you can see in the first column, a uh, name is the topics or main contents to be tested. And actually it's called the tech construct, the main uh, kind of competencies that the teachers are going to test. And it includes uh, the listening, um, yeah, phonetics, language focus, reading and writing. Um, and then the teacher, pro um, basically they divide um, the, all the kind of the other contents based on the cognitive levels, which um, include the knowledge, comprehension, application. In application, they have low application and high application. And the last column is the sum, kind of like the summary uh, for each of the test contract uh, to be tested here. So, uh, in uh, some of the um, the part here, I I show that, for example, in listening, in the knowledge column, they mention listen and decide the true or false statement. In comprehension, it is listen and complete the sentence. So actually, that one refers to the task format. Yeah. In the next one, they provide the information about the numbers of items and the weighting. For example, the number of item of uh, sentences are five, and the point is 1.25. The rate is 12.5% um, for each of the cognitive level here. And the sum will be, uh, the total number of sentences can be 10, the point will be uh, point by, uh, two by uh, 2.5, and the rate is 25% out of 100%. Um, however, in the next construct, which refer to phonetics, in the knowledge column, they um, mention the different kind of individual sounds. So actually, it's not the test format. It is the tag construct. Okay. Oh, um, again, they have the information about the numbers of items and weighting for phonetics. In the next one, language focus. Again, the teachers mention the different points to be tested, like the verb of liking, adjective, coordinating conjunction, or the present simple, the future simple, and they divide by cognitive levels. And actually, this refers to the different uh, sub-construct to be tested. Uh, again, it is a tag construct. In reading, it is about the task format again, and the same for writing is also the task format. So uh, what I want to um, emphasize here is that because this one is a magic, this is not a real test spec. So the information here is not enough for the item writer or for the teacher to design the test. And also, um, you see that the information mentioned in the metric is like doesn't follow a systematic order. Yeah, sometimes the test construct and the test formats um, are, mixed, are mixed here. So I would like to suggest um, another uh, I would like to suggest a test spec, yeah, which I think maybe um, will be work for this case. So I also work on the test um, seven, for English 7, the original um, test spec that I just show you. But this one I divide into the different parts of information for the test spec. The first one is called the topics or main contents to be tested or construct. The second column is construct components. And then I have the six different cognitive levels according to the uh, Bloom taxonomy, that um, version that Dr. Quinn just shared with you, which include recognition, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And then I have another column for task format. And then it's gonna be number of items and weighting. And the last part will be the summary uh, information. Okay. Um, actually, the test spec here doesn't include all the thing that we um, expect to mention uh, to cover in a sample test spec. But I think it will be it will work for our real situation. 
Um, so let's take listening as one example. For listening, this one is the main construct to be tested. And the components of the listening skill here will uh, cover listening for details and make, making inferences. Okay. Uh, why I say so, you can see that here is the sample item. Yeah. In part one, the, teach, uh, the students are required to listen and decide the two or four statements. And here we have five different sentences. Okay. So, for example, sentence number one, Fook does volunteer work because he thinks it makes a difference in the community. So if the student can listen to Fook talking about his voluntary work and then um, notice of a detail when he mentioned, for example, he thinks it makes a difference in the community. So they choose the answer as true. They will be listening for details. Um, however, like in number four, my things, volunteering is not a special work. So I suppose, because I don't have the script here, I suppose that um, uh, my doesn't mention something like directly about her opinion for volunteering work is not a special work. But maybe from her talk, we can make an inference that she thinks it's not a special work. For example, if it's true um, answer. So I put here as listening for details and making inference, inferences. In terms of cognitive level, um, actually, according to the original version, the cognitive level is recognition. That means that it just needs to recall or to remember information. But based on the sample items below, I believe that it should cover like uh, the high, um, higher cognitive levels. For example, comprehension, analysis. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, it depends on the teacher's um, preference and the curriculum to choose which one will be the cognitive levels to be focused on. In the next column about task format, um, I want to point out the specific name of the task form, the, the format here. So for the first, the first part, it is selected response. The second one is limited production. It means that the student need to listen and complete the sentences here. Uh, but I want to highlight that the teacher need to mention the number of words that student need to fill the blank. Because here, the requirement is only listen and complete the sentences. So to make it clear for the test taker, the teachers need to say how many words or phrases or number that student need to fill the blank. And then in the next column of number of items and waiting, we have uh, I keep um, the number information about sentences, about points, but I change read to wait because as Miss um, Quinn mentioned before, this one refers to the waiting of the items or the part here. And then the correct name of, um, um, of the things should be wait. And I keep the column for sums here. So this one is the detail um, description of the first part for the test for listening. Okay. Uh, and then in the suggested uh, test back here, I also present the other uh, part related to phonic, uh, phonetics. Okay. Grammar. Uh, this one, oh, sorry, I, I think I should spend some time on this for things here. In the original uh, metrics, the teacher call is language focus. But actually, based on the construct components to be tested. Yeah, I change it into grammar. And here we can see that we have recognition and comprehension as the level that a teacher can base on to check the student cognitive levels, okay? And because the teachers ask the student to circle, uh, to choose the best answer from the four options. So this one is selected response, okay? And uh, the other information about numbers and item, Unwitting can be seen in the test back here. Okay, so I think that it is better to ch to show it should be like, for example, if you say language focus, it can be grammar and vocabulary. But if you like specify its grammar, it will be easier 
for the test designer or the item writer to base on to work in designing the items. Okay, and it can be the same for reading. Okay, and for writing. So I think due to the uh, time limit, I will not spend any more time on the spur like detailed information about each of the construct here because I will share with you this one later. Um, please share the last so part. that we can upload to the forum. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, it's my pleasure. And the last one will be the total. Uh, it show the number of sentences or the number of items to be tested. The uh, uh, point uh, system it is out of 10 and the weight will be 100%. Yeah, so it will be um, enough for the test specification for grade seven. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And now, um, can you move on with uh, Dr. Wing? Thank you very much, Tao, for the excellent work. And actually, uh, I'd like to share it again. And okay. Every time when you stop sharing, my face appear very big on the screen. <laughs> yeah, beautiful face. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tao, for the excellent work. And it leads me to the return of the webinar. And it's actually the sharing just now also show a lot of um, uh, the issues that we have um, uh, talked about during this webinar. And I think we have touched upon the following questions for the webinar. First, we have answered what the test is, what can a test be used for, and what does a test assess? Of course, that is the test construct, and how to choose those test construct based on the curriculum and the CEFR. Just now, Tao show you how the, um, the grounding of the curriculum is the starting point and how she actually refer back to the CEFR, right? Especially when the examples of the grammar just now that she mentioned. And the fifth questions that we have answered is what types of test can match which purposes, right? Whether the test is summative or formative, whether we use direct or indirect, whether we use the objective test or the subjective test for the purpose that you want to. And also we have also mentioned, uh, or we have discussed the different test formats that are commonly used um, that you can use for your items. So that like, like the uh, realizations of the test items that you want to, to test the certain construct. The second question is, how can a test blend and design? So we need to have a few considerations when planning your test and when you design the test. And finally, I also talked about the procedure of test development. And um, basically, I'm sure these are the questions that I have talked about, but I'm sure you will have more questions to ponder your test development. And I recommend you to read these references in order to find more information. And that brings an end to my um, sharing. And now I'd like to um, move to uh, send the screen back to Ms. Chiang and uh, with the questions and answers session. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh, Ms. Nguyễn Thị Phương Thảo, and Ms. Phạm Thị Thanh Huyền for your useful, very useful, and very practical sharings about test design and development. And to all the participants, if you have any more questions to ponder, like Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh has just mentioned, please type directly and privately your questions to our secretary today, Ms. Phương Mai so that she can collect all the questions and we can deal with it within the Q&A section. Now let's proceed to the discussion between the facilitators and the speakers. Uh, Ms. Dao Thị Ngân, 
as a high school teacher, I guess that it might be challenging for you to design and develop tests. Do you have any questions to our speaker and other facilitators? Ms. Dalkinen? Yes. Thank you very much for your useful sharing. Um, and I have uh, listened very attentively to your sharing. And I find them very interesting and useful for me. However, when uh, designing a test, I uh, usually encounter some difficulties. And one of them is that I don't know um, which resources that I can use to design a test. So could you, could you suggest some useful resources to uh, design a test for high school students? Mm -hmm. I would like to invite Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh to address the question from Ms. Ngân, please. Okay, thank you very much. This is the very um, good questions. And I think um, so uh, a lot of teachers might share this question as well. And um, so I think in terms of the useful resources for test development, um, these are the different types of resources that you may want, you may need. The first would be the resources for identification of test construct, or in other words, um, in order for you to choose what to test. And the second types of source, uh, resource that you need would be the resources for sample words or phrases and even text at different proficiency level, like A2 level, what should be tested. And um, the third types of resources would be the tools for text selection and adaptation because now you can have to a lot of text, but you need to know which you to select the correct or the best, um, the most suitable one for you and how to adapt them to your curriculum related purposes. With that, now I'd like to invite my colleague, uh, Ms. Bui Hit Sao, to share um, the, um, her sharing of the resources for test development. And I, now I'd like to um, give the floor to Sao. Sao, are you ready? Yeah, hi everyone, I am Sao. And now I will introduce some resources which are helpful for your test developing. Um, okay. Slide show. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, the first tool you can resource to when developing your test is the bank of descriptors provided by equals. If you click on the link provided here, you can get a set to and download the PDF files of the descriptor bank. And here is an example of some listening ability descriptors for learners at A2 level. Besides the objectives stated in the textbook and the curriculum, you can refer to these descriptions to decide which construct or ability you want to test your students. And a similar resource I would like to introduce is the can-do statement list by the LT, which also states what language learners can do at specific levels. And here are some examples of statements of what a language learner can do for listening and speaking at level A1 with the social and tourist topic. And moreover, we also have uh, some other tools to determine the CFR levels of uh, vocabulary. And I would like to introduce here the English profile and Lex tutor. Firstly, with English profile, you can you can both get you, you can get access to the vocabulary list of particular level from A1 to C2. For example, here we have uh, the B2 level vocabulary list. And moreover, uh, you can also 
uh, analyze a text with the help of a uh, text inspector section. There will be a space for you to input your text and then after clicking on the start workflow button, you will get some statistics on the percentage of vocabulary at each uh, CFR level. For example, here you can see that 21% uh, of the words in this text are at uh, A2 level. And the whole text will also be shown to you with the CFR level text uh, next to each word. Uh, for example, here you can see that teachers is at A1, content is at B2. And uh, in addition, uh, the English profile also allows you to check the level of grammar points. You will have to use uh, the EGP online function right here. And this is an example with some can-do statements in grammar. Uh, it can be understood that, for example, here, an A2 student can use but to join a limited range of common uh, adjectives after B. And uh, uh, English profile also provides you some example sentences here. And you can make use of the download button to download the whole list. And secondly, uh, LexTutor also be another uh, helpful tools for text analysis. And here is the website address. You will need to click on vocab profile and then VP complete. And then you will have a space to type or paste your text. And then next you will have to choose one among these vocabulary list. Uh, uh, Lex tutors provide you offer you with um, BNC or Coker or even CFR. For example, here I choose the BNC word list, and uh, after uh, and after that you will need to click on the submit window button right down here, and uh, the Lex tutor will give you the result. For example, here um, my text have. Uh, 68% of uh, K1, uh, K1 words, K1 level, and 14% uh, uh, are at uh, K2 level. So in general, uh, those two English profile and Lex tutor are two powerful tools for you to analyze and adapt your text. Um, for example, if you find that your text is a little bit difficult with many B1 words, but uh, you are uh, you, you want to test A2 student, so you can try to replace uh, your B1 words with uh, their synonyms at A1 or A2 levels, or you may want to simplify the structures used in your text so that it, um, it is better aligned with your students' levels. So uh, these are some tools for you. Uh, I hope that you can utilize the, those resources I have presented here to uh, develop your test so that you will have the best test that serves your purpose. Thank I think that's the end of my introduction of resources. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Can you stop um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's move on to the suggestions for follow-up activities from Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳ. Okay, so I think these are the tools that um, Sao have mentioned. These are the three types of tools that the, need, the teacher would need for their development of tasks. And um, so I hope these are useful. And I would like to, um, so that is for the first questions and um, see if you have any other questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that um, other question, I will uh, ask the um, our secretary to give me the questions and then we will move on to the Q&A. But uh, before we move on to the Q&A, do you have any other 
suggestions for the follow-up activities? Oh, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I do. Um, here, is the, here are the suggestions for the follow-up activities. I think the first is that you should identify the sub-competencies of the expected learning outcomes of the course you are teaching. Very detailed, um, uh, based on the CEFR. Um, and um, the second one is that you should develop a test specification for use in your course. And you provide rationales for the choices you make for this test. And the third activities would be, I um, like you to use Lex Tutor to adapt one reading text to be used in your test. Of course, you need to identify the purpose of that, uh, that text, what level and what you want that text to cover, what construct you want to cover in that test. And then you use Lex Tutor to adapt it and uh, for your use or in your test. Okay, so um, we would love to hear from you later after this webinar and uh, share your works on these three activities. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Nguyễn Thị Ngọc Quỳnh. Uh, let me continue the webinar with the questions from our participants today. Thanks so much for listening and watching the webinar attentively and sending us these very interesting questions. Uh, first, I'd like to um, ask um, Ms. Chị Ngọc Anh to raise your question. Ms. Chị Ngọc Anh, are you still here with us? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, please. Um, but do you think we have time? Yeah, I think um, we still have time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's quite a big question. So maybe you can ask someone to have a question first if they have a more specific one. Because my question is about more about theoretical framework um, that Ms. Dr. Quinn just mentioned about Bloom's taxonomy. Mm -hmm. As yeah. a um, takes about two or three minutes to address this question, so I think yeah, I to... yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing why uh, she apply uh, Bloom's taxonomy, the original one, rather than the revised one. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think um, in order to make the decision of what. Um, taxonomy of the cognitive levels or not, uh, to choose on is not the easier of what to choose rather than, I mean, there are a few uh, um, um, systems that we use in order to identify the complexity level of test items. And for this webinar, I chose the original version um, just for the ease of uh, finding the, the examples to show you. But of yeah. course, you can yeah. see like in Tao case, we see that a lot of teachers now are using um, like uh, the knowledge, um, uh, comprehensions, low applications and high applications, for example. Yeah. So in terms of uh, terms, terminology, um, we can decide the systems uh, uh, that we, we prefer. We decide to choose the system that you prefer. But what is the underlying basis that needs to be identified here is that you can actually identify what the student or what the test takers need to do with the, with the items that, that you are writing or developing. So I prefer the kind of the the older versions, just to show you that the core of the, of the work is exactly what to do with the systems rather than what systems you choose. You see what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. so the, the concepts of complexity is underlying in, mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the fact that we need to identify what the student or what the test taker do um, at that point with the, with the test construct. So I chose that because it's still in use. And I know that there are so many other systems of um, uh, complexity as also being used. So that's my answer to the question. 
I hope. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good meeting. Oh, good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, another question that we received from the participants is how to design multiple choice question effectively. And actually, this is the sharing from uh, Ms. Hoang Thị Sao and also Ms. Tạ Thị Mai Hương, the coordinator of our webinar. So now we would like to proceed to the sharing from Ms. Tạ Thị Mai Hương. Uh, Ms. Tạ Thị Mai Hương, please share your screen and please limit your sharing to five minutes only. I know that you have lots of interesting and practical information to share with our participants, but please limit your sharing. Thank okay. You. Thank you, Ms. Chan, for your introduction and reminder. <laughs> yeah, I'm sharing with you my screen. And um, can you see the screen now? Great. Yeah, okay. So I'm talking about how to design multiple choice test item. And um, firstly, I would like to tell you about the advantages of MCQ, and this was referred to by, Mr. by Dr. Quinn before. Scoring of MCQ is reliable, rapid, simple, and economical. Then more items can be included in a test. Tests cause less stress and nervousness than other times. And that's the reason why MCQ are quite popular now, right? And um, one of the questions I often received, and it was also my question of how many items is enough for one test? And as far as I read from some um, materials uh, like headings said that uh, at least 50 items could make um, the test more reliable. And um, now we come to the components of an MCQ. Um, so can you look at this example and tell me, or you can type your, quest, your answer on the chat box. Um, what are the components of an MCQ? So the first one here you see that's the instruction, right? And the second one you see here, this is called a stem. And then we have A, B, C, and those are called the options. The choices are the alternatives with A is the correct answer. We call it the answer. Learns and learned are the distractors. So as I said before, A, B, and C here are called the options, the choices and the alternatives. And then now we move on to the main part of this uh, of my presentation, um, which is about the guidelines for writing MCQ. Uh, the first one is write item precisely, clearly, and as simple as possible. That one helps the test taker to understand the question. Um, then next, ensure the consistent grammar from the stem to all respond options. And in fact, we have a 12, guidelines, I'm sorry, um, night guidelines, and um, uh, trying to give you some example for all of them. Um, I will not read um, each one here, but show you the example for, yeah, for to clarify the guidelines. Um, the first one is quite obvious, so I will not refer to it uh, anymore. Now we move on to the principle number two. Um, the test designer should make sure that uh, the grammar is consistent from the stem to all the respond option. As you can see in the two example here, the first one, if this, um, this one is uh, aimed at testing the understanding of the meaning of those words, but because um, we have n here, so the test taker can get, can predict the answer, um, that's A rather than knowing the meaning of those words. So it might not be um, as reliable as we, um, we expect, right? Uh, so the second one is much better when we use a uh, or an. So in this way, they have to uh, think about the meaning of the words uh, to be able to choose the correct answer. And for principle number three, make sure the items contain no netless redundancy. As you can see here um, in the alternatives A, I mean the options A, B, and C, uh, they have flat on his face, all are the same. So this one could be put into the stem like in the uh, second example. 
So that will reduce the reading burden of the test ticker. Now we move on to um, principle number four. The test designer should try to avoid the use of negatives or highlight them if they decide to use it. For example, in the first one, in the first example here, you see not is not highlighted or capitalized. So the test ticker may not um, pay attention to it and choose the wrong answer. Um, and for the second one, this is much better as the test designer focused um, as text designer um, highlighted the words by capitalizing it. And this is one suggested um, principle. So next for number five, um, the test designer should avoid double negatives. For example, in this test item, uh, this is not suggested way to write a test item because you know double negatives will like make the test sticker be confused and that will um, increase the possibility of choosing the wrong answer, not based on what they understand about the, uh, the test, but uh, because they are uh, confused with the question. For number six, make sure that all the distractors are plausible. Um, uh, here, I mean, I think um, the principle means that the the test designer should try to write the distractor, should make the, distra uh, the distractor as attractive to the test taker as um, in an uh, in the equal basis. Um, so the first way to do it is to avoid options like none of the above, all of the above, both A and B are using the extreme words like always, never, all or none, because this might catch the attention of the test taker more than the other options. Then the next um, suggestion is to keep a similar length for all response options. Uh, you know, some years ago when I uh, taught my student how to do TOEIC tests, some of my students said that if they didn't know the answer, then they would choose um, the, le the longest uh, answer. And that's the reason why the test taker should bear in their minds that um, similar length for all response options should be uh, used. Okay. And next, another strategy is to ensure the options are mutually exclusive. Do you often see this kind of options in uh, a test? Um, this is one of the example I, um, I took out from a book and you see for A, we have one, two, glasses. For B, from two to three. C, three to four. D, at least four glasses. So you see that those uh, options are quite overlap, right? So in order to make it better, you should write the test. I mean, the test designer should write a clearer question and the answer should not be overlapped like in the second example sphere. And then, now we move on to um, principle number seven. Um, the test designer should keep the number of options consistent. You look at these three examples here, if it, uh, if it appears in the same test. So the first question has only two options, the second with three options, and the final one four options. That, uh, that should be avoided. And you should keep uh, all of them three with three options or with four options or with two options, okay. And we go to the next one. Put the answers in random position. So this is one example. Sometimes as we uh, do not pay much attention when uh, putting the answer, the options. So sometimes uh, for many sentences, um, the answers are in the same order, in the same position. Like for this text, for example, all of the uh, correct answer are in A. So this will, you know, like increase the possibility for student. I mean, uh, some students are lucky to choose all of the A answer and they got all correct. So this should be avoided. Now for um, the next principle, make sure there is only one correct or the best answer or make clear that there are more than one answer. Like um, in the first example, 
uh, the instruction is choose the best answer here with answer is in a singular form. So the uh, test taker can understand that only one answer is correct. But for the next one, next example here, um, the test designer have to indicate that there are two correct answer. And um, that's uh, all of the principles for uh, writing MCQ items. And this works for all of the um, MCQ test item. Now we move on to, I move to more principle for writing vocabulary item. And I only focus on the two that didn't appear in the previous principle that I have just referred to. So the first one here is, um, if the item is to text meaning, the distractor should be the same form of words as the correct answer. Like, can you see, can you look at these three example and, and choose which uh, of the two are the, which are the two correct, um, which are the two, you know, better test items? So for the first one here, we see four options. The first one is a noun, uh, B is an adjective, prepare is a verb, and D traditionally is an adverb. So you see this um, does not um, satisfy this requirement, right? The principle here. So it is not acceptable. But for number two and three, this one, number two is to um, test the meaning of the word. So and all of them were, uh, all of them are in the same part of speech, so it is acceptable when designing tests. And for number three, because this is um, in this um, test item, the test designer would like to test the understanding of the part of speech, and that's the reason why all comes from one um, root, and the uh, and all the options um, are derivations of the root word. So it's also acceptable, and you can see these are quite typical in uh, TOEIC's test. And then another principle that I didn't refer to before is that uh, the test taker, the test designer, should avoid using distractor with the same or opposite meanings. In fact, this um, can um, why the test designer are advised to do so. It is because this, if you, if the test designer use the distractor with the same or opposite meaning, this will um, like increase or decrease the attractive needs to the test takers. I mean that like, for example, when you use surprise and cheerful because please surprise cheerful barred. Here, please and cheerful have similar meaning. So uh, the test taker might eliminate these two um, options because they think both word cannot be correct um, and for the second one, like you see, um, finished, close, ended, and conclude should be a um, good choice to design the options here because they, uh, they had similar meaning, but they, are, um, they have some shades of meaning differently. And so only one word can be used in this uh, situation. And now I talk about um, two more principles for um, writing grammar items. And uh, the first one is avoid using mixed options. I think that many of you may, and the second one is avoid nonsense distractor. So what is kind of mixed option and what uh, are called a nonsense distractor, I'm going to tell you now. And for principle number three is to avoid using inconsistent distractors. So I give some example to clarify this. Um, next, can you look at this one? Choose the best answer to complete the following sentence. We have the first one have been, our word had been, and we, um, this one is not really good because, you know, here um, the test designer intend to test whether uh, the test taker understand the different tenses in English. But um, by designing the option in this way, the test take, uh, have to understand both the tense and also the singular and plural forms of the verb before choosing this word and then uh, this the uh, the answer and for number two here it should be i think it should be better because um in terms of tenses uh testica only 
a focus on the understanding of the test to be able to choose the correct answer in the second example. And the reason why, I, I think that the reason why we should only test one grammatical point in one sentence like, like, like this, we can, we will discuss more when we have time after this webinar. And then for number two, yeah, <laughs> avoiding nonsense distractors. What is called uh, nonsense? Can you look at this one and try to think about that? For example, in the first example, you see um, the options like fast, faster, and more fast. And in the second example, you see did not behave, did not behave, and have not behaved. And the problem, uh, the problems of these two examples is that without the stem, like without the stem, you still can choose the correct answer, right? Okay, yeah. so you can see fast, faster, more fast, more fast could not be the correct answer. Uh, and similarly, uh, did not behave in B cannot be the correct answer in any um, in any cases. So you don't have to read the stem to be able to choose the correct answer. But when you design when you design a multiple choice test, uh, the stem and the options should be closely related. So um, that's all of the principles that I have collected and summarized from some of the uh, books that I have read and hope that this can help you to uh, improve the quality of the test item that you design. Um, then for, uh, for the final one here, avoid using inconsistent yeah. distractor. Like uh, for this one, you can see this and it here are both pronounced. Why it is a um, adjective a possessive adjective, so it is not of the same kind and it's also uh, be suggested to be avoided. Uh, and um, well, as I said before, this is all of my uh, sharing and I hope that this will be useful for you. And here are some of the suggested materials for reading if you want to look for more um, information about how to design a test item of, um, of multiple choice test. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mai Huang. Uh, very practical and very useful in my view. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, do you have any more further things to share about designing multiple choice okay. questions? Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Huang, for the great work. Actually, I think that it's very detailed and this is a very big uh, issue. And um, uh, but unfortunately, I don't think that we can actually address that issues within the, this webinar. But we are happy to uh, interact with you further, um, maybe uh, later after the webinar, um, and, or we can have a, a future webinar on just specifically on MCQ, which is a very commonly used task type. And with that, I actually thank you very much for um, joining my webinar. And thank you very much for all the colleagues that um, joined me in this webinar and um, to help uh, uh, with their sharings. And <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Queen. I strongly believe that building the ability to design and develop good tests requires teachers to spend much time reading references and practicing. We hope that you might acquire an overview as well as several specific details of test design and development, particularly the test specification and task, test, task types. After webinar three, you will be provided with more references for follow-up reading and practicing uh, with a suggestion from Dr. Quinn and other facilitators. If you have any further questions, feel free to post them to our webinar forum on the British website or keep in touch with our speakers and facilitators via email. We will assist you more. And this brings me nicely on to the summary of webinar three. So you have just heard the sharings and the suggestions from our speaker and facilitators, as well as their discussions about test design and development. And now I'd like to um, introduce about the next webinar. Uh, let me see our sharing. 
it is a, the webinar on free online learning resources with Dr. Bui Thi Khoi Nguyen. Um, I don't know what happened with my laptop today. I cannot show the, <laughs> I cannot change the slide. <laughs> Here it is. Can you see the information about webinar number four? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's great. So uh, our uh, speaker is Dr. Bui Thi Khoi Nguyen and the webinar is about free online learning resources scheduled on the 23rd of February 2020, the first webinar of the next year. Right. So thank you so much for taking part with us so far. And I know that this is the longest webinar so far because we have so many interesting and practical information that we'd like to share with you. So we look forward to welcoming you to the upcoming PD webinars exclusive to Vietnamese K-12 EFL teachers. And uh, the upcoming information about the webinars will be uploaded on our uh, uh, VTSO website and uh, remember to um, click on the link for the proof of attendance and feedback survey for sending us what you think can help us improve our webinar and also to be eligible for an electronic certificate for attending the webinar today and thank you so much thank you very much everyone thank you thank you dr queen thank you all the facilitators Thank you all, yeah. Miss Jan. <laughs> oh, great work. Thank you, so my for assistance. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Goodbye. Bye. Have a good lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will. Uh...